I know is so explosive. Welcome, Climate Viewers. My name is Jim Lee from Climate Viewer News. It's January 31st, 2016. And uh, my website got hacked. So uh, we're going to talk about chemtrails today. Because I've got a lot of questions from my last, previous two videos. And I uh, just wanted to update you guys on what's going on. So yeah, Climate Viewer News got hacked. Um, lost everything. They said, allegedly, two of my raid drives died simultaneously. I lost all data. So I recreated the website. It is now hosted on WordPress.com. So you can reblog stuff, um, you know, like it and all that stuff. But I got most of everything back up now. Um, you can check it out. Still at ClimateViewer.com. And this is my page um, right here, Jim Lee at the top. And you can see a little bit about me, um, you know, my story and all that. See my Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube so you can keep in touch. But um, we're going to talk today about chemtrails because apparently a lot of people just really don't get what the hell I'm doing. And, you know, a lot of people say, well, Jim, you don't even believe in chemtrails. You think it's all pollution. Not true. I want to clarify that to begin with. Um... I believe that, you know, most of what's going on, you know, can be attributed probably to pollution, but I happen to know the history of secret government experiments, and I know that this, you know, from day one, when I first studied this three years ago, I was of the notion that this there's something really shady going on. So I started looking into that, and um, yeah, you can take a lot of these government reports with a grain of salt because of course they you know actively deceive us we all know that um but i've been you know trying to focus on what you know tangibles i can use to do something about it because you can't just walk into a you know government lab or, or go into a, a hearing or talk to your senator and say you know it's, it's a secret program and we know it because you know you can't prove that so that makes it kind of tough um, but for me, I've you know tried to focus on things that I can prove and then try to draw the assumptions from there. So things we can prove, um, carbon black dust, weather modification, long history of it, military says they're going to do it. Um, and that's kind of the things I've been focusing on. So what we're going to talk today about is some history, um, some of the current facts, and what to do about chemtrails and how I... You know, visualize the process of dealing with something that most likely is a government program and secret and um, something termed rogue geoengineering. So let's get right to it. Um, first article up for the um, conversation today. It was a conspiracy military experiments on unsuspecting public. Now, first up, we have uh, weather warfare and depo um, defoliation. And what we're talking about here is something that preceded the uh, 1978 NMOD Convention on the Prohibition of Military and Other Hostile Use of Environmental Modification Techniques. This was a global ban on weather warfare. Um, and it happened as a result of what was called Operation Popeye. And Operation Popeye was where the U.S. military... Um, you know, sprayed silver and lead iodide into clouds above Vietnam uh, to increase the normal monsoon rainfall, um, and uh, that that would you know soak the ground, make it imp almost impossible for them to do it. So it says here, the program was authorized um, authorized three WC-130s and two RF-4C aircraft with associated crews and main, uh, maintenance personnel. The three aircraft uh, were. Uh, you know, spraying 3.6 million, um, hold on, I'm, I'm reading it wrong here. However, these aircraft, which operated out of Thailand, were not dedicated exclusively to the cloud seeding missions. WC-130s also conducted tropical typhoon reconnaissance and tactical weather reconnaissance support missions. The RF-4Cs performed regular photo reconnaissance missions. The annual cost total of the program was approximately $3.6 million, covering operations and maintenance, temporary duty pay, and seeding materials, with reference. Um, then, when they were busted, this is fascinating. When they were busted, um, they, uh, they had a, con a congressional hearing, and they lied top brass from military lied right through their teeth 
And this is a quote. Laird wasn't the only official whose 1972 weather modification testimony was untruthful. Benjamin Foreman, a senior Department of Defense lawyer, reiterated Laird's denial later that year. We have not, as Secretary Laird has previously said, ever engaged in weather modification activities in northern Vietnam. That's a lie. Continuing... At the same hearing, the deputy director of the U.S. Arms Control and Disarmament Agency had similar difficulties. Asked by Senator Pell if rainmaking projects had been approved by Laos in Thailand, Philip Farley replied, I don't wish even to admit, sir, that there were such projects. And this is from the U.S. Senate Subcommittee on the Oceans and International Environment, 26 July 1972. As a result of this, um, there's several you know, prominent weather modification papers that are out there. Um, weather modification problems, prospects, and um, in the future, you know, it was a report on all of the weather modification activities in America. You know, they, they just said, wait a minute, you know, this is getting kind of crazy. We need to make some reports. Um, and as a result of this, there was a ban worldwide on that. Um, and you know, that is still in place today. The only problem with that ban there's no way to verify it. To this day, there's no way to tell the difference between a normal cloud and a chemtrail cloud or a weather mod- modified cloud. They have no way to tell. So similarly, in a, I think in the 50s, they banned upper, upper atmospheric nuclear explosions. And it wasn't until 1996 when they actually built a system to catch people doing it. And these are infrasound recorders and you know all kinds of other devices to tell when a when a nuclear explosion goes off, where it happened, when it happened, and who did it. So what we need now to really you know hammer home the problem and, and fix this you know solution is something I've got right up here at the top. You can see geoengineering weather modification exposed. At the bottom of the page, I lay out what I consider to be, you know a partial solution at the very least, and I call it the clarity clause, a solution. And I say right here, when atmospheric nuclear uh, testing was banned in 1963, no verification system existed. In 1996, the Comprehensive Nuclear Test Ban Treaty created an international monitoring system consisting of 337 forensic seismology, hydroacoustic, infrasound, and radionuclide monitoring stations around the world to listen for the distinct sounds of nuclear explosions trust but verify so the, since they banned it you know it only took them you know what for uh, almost uh, 50 years to um, do something about it so there's that uh, well let's say 30 something years um, then when they ban- they banned it with NMOD they never created a verification system so we cannot detect rogue geoengineering cannot verify the cloud seeding projects produce va- provable results or even predict the weather with any certainty because they don't have the, you know the computer models or the sensors necessary to do it so what I'm saying is here's my my draft legislation to do something about it to protect life from man-made weather events the na- all nations shall one create a multilateral registry of cloud seeding geoengineering and atmospheric experimentation events let's zoom in on this so everybody can read along at home create a multilateral registry of cloud seeding geoengineering and atmospheric experimentation events with information and data collection on key characteristics and publish hourly updates on activities to a publicly available website and create an atmospheric sensor network for verification so we can catch them require nations states persons to notify the multilateral registry multilateral means all you know individuals um multilateral registry at least 24 hours prior to initiation of atmospheric experimentation modification to ensure public notice and liability should said experimentation modification cause monetary environmental or physical losses meaning dead people so if you go and you modify the weather we want to know in advance so that we can track the results of your you know experimentations and if you hurt people break stuff you're going to be pay for it um, number three, verify the chemical composition of our atmosphere with a global network of sensors with data publicly available. And by that, I mean radiation monitoring, uh, you know, chemical weapons monitoring, uh, obviously silver, lead, iodide, you know, CO2, the dry ice that they put in the assault, all, the, all of the chemicals that they use to modify the weather. 
including radiation. And I don't mean like, um, you know, the EPA's radnet that they shut off during the Fukushima um, explosion. I mean a publicly available sensor network that is, you know, vetted, tested, it works, and can protect us. So that's my solution. We really need to build a sensor network. And that's kind of what I've been working on over here at Climate Viewer 3D is getting all of the sensors I can to go ahead and try to catch some people. But, you know, of course, we're going to need more than just um, some open source available software to do that. So um, back to the task at hand. This is, this is the history of the U.S. government, you know, doing weather warfare and lying under oath, um, doing bug warfare on its own people. Uh, Operation Big Itch. September 1954 series of tests at the Dugway Proving Ground in Utah to determine coverage patterns and survivability of tropical rat flea use in biological warfare as a disease vector. So something that can transfer diseases like the Zika virus everybody's hearing about. Oh, mosquitoes? Yes, they've used mosquitoes. In night, Operation Big Buzz, in 1955, the U.S. state of Georgia 330,000 uninfected mosquitoes were dropped from aircraft with E-14 bombs and dispersed from the ground. Operation May Day, April to November 1956, Savannah, Georgia, designed to reveal information about the dispersal of yellow fever mosquitoes in an urban area. The mosquitoes were released from a ground level. Operation Dropkick, 1956 test in Savannah, Georgia, when uninfected infected mosquitoes were released in a residential neighborhood and another 1956 test in Avon Park bombing range Florida where 600,000 mosquitoes were released by plane that's crazy but that's what they're doing they want to test to see if they can introduce diseases into populaces via mosquitoes like the Zika virus um, also this um, this is the big one right here coming down let's go on down Zinc cadmium sulfide. So they, the U.S. Army Chemical Corps sprayed almost all of America with radioactive zinc cadmium sulfide to, quote, test to see the effects of if a nuclear bomb were dispersed, where the, the fog of radioactive material would go. <coughs> so Operation Large Area Coverage, 1957 to 58, U.S. Army Chemical Corps operated operation which dispersed microscopic zinc cadmium sulfide particles over most of the United States from a C-119 flying boxcar. The purpose was to determine the dispersion and geographic range of biological or chemical agents. Whoa. Operation Do 1 and 2 consisted of five separate trials from blah 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 that were designed to test the feasibility of maintaining a large aerosol cloud released offshore until it drifted over land achieving a large area coverage and then here's the big one the manhattan rochester coalition coalition research on the health effects of radioactive materials and tests on vulnerable populations without consent in st louis 1945 to 1970 now these jerks sprayed all of these places which you can see here oh that's real nice they're real nice thanks for that um, what you can see here, um, total quantities in cadmium sulfide, 1,600 kilograms, um, Corpus Christi, all the way through Texas, Washington, Nevada, the whole damn United States, Dugway Proving Ground, of course, at the bottom. And um, this was released by the subcommittee on zinc cadmium sulfide. And, of course, they say in their report it did not have any effect on uh, health. You know, it was completely non-toxic. But you can come right back up here and watch this video and zoom down here to the end and you'll see um, some people that were interviewed that specifically say, no, we had, uh, you know, that's the lady that wrote the report. And these, you know, people say, no, we had uh, sores all over our bodies and yeah, it really messed us up. Um, so that's that. So what we see from this is, yes, the military has experimented on us in the past. They probably are doing it today. And this is the kicker. This is why I do what I do. This was not released to the public for 40 freaking years so let's remind each other weather warfare in vietnam lied about it lied about it under oath in congress um st louis all of this um radioactive material they released it they didn't lied about it for 40 years it wasn't released they won't if they are doing what we think they're doing we probably won't find out about it till we're old and gray because they want to wait till the people who did it die so that they don't have to go to jail. 
which they should. So moving along. Um, this is another article I wrote, Chemtrails, Calmatives and Terrorism. Now, this is the modern day version of it. This is stuff that we know is going on today. And what we're talking about is um, with calmatives, chemical weapons. There's different types of chemical weapons, harassing agents, tear agents, vomiting agents, malodorants, incapacitating agents, psychological agents, um, lethal ones that are blistering agents, blood choking, and nerve agents. These are chemical weapons that are um, you know, designed to hurt people. So they came up with this one here, and these are called calmatives. Now they're like the nicer version of it, also known as non-lethal warfare. There's a thing called the Joint Non-Lethal Warfare Division, JNLWD, right there. So this is great. Um, presentation front for the Airline Pilot Association after um, September 11th. This is October 2001. This is Joint Non-Lethal Weapon Do um, Division's Narco Airways presentation made by then. Commander Colonel George Fenton to the Airline Pilots Association shortly after September 11th. The presentation begins with several slides um, that are standard JNLWD promotional material, including photos from the non lethal mortar objective individual combat weapon. That's the OICW, it's a handheld gun that fires chemical weapon grenades, um, both of which are involved in chemical payloads. Starting with slide 11, the presentation moves to discussing the use of incapacitating agents on commercial airlines. Initially, the numbers blah blah blah. Placement of incapacitating aerosol generators on board as well as injectable pharmaceuticals unit outside of the cockpit door. There you go. So, now we're tying the chemical weapons to planes and a direct discussion with the airline industry of putting here an armed door with a smoke generator, injectable pharmaceutical and tasers right there in the floorboard, uh, and, and, an entanglement net that can drop from the ceiling and just pacify the whole thing, slippery foam dispensers, so make the whole floor slick there so you know people fall over, incapacitate agent generator in the back of the plane, sprays a cloud in the plane, puts everybody to sleep. Scary stuff. But, very real. Moving along, the gay bomb. You cannot make this shit up. This was, uh, what was it called? The, the, the Razzies, I think it's called. The, the, the Peace Prize. Um, these, one, this was a winner. And you can see the link there. The Air Force Wright-Patterson Air Force um, Laboratory, Dayton, Ohio, for instigating research and development on a chemical weapon. So the so-called gay bomb, Wikipedia link, that will make you enemies, soldiers, become sexually ir irresistible to each other and get it on and the reference for that harassing annoying and bad guy identifying chemicals right patterson air force base and there's your link it's from web.archive.org now most of the stuff i'm talking about here today came from something called the sunshine project and you can see all the links here this is where the their foia papers are and yes this is very real <laughs> the gay bomb so um, let's see if we can pull that up real quick. Let me go back here. I'm going to just delete some of this off. And this is the Sunshine Project. So this was an amazing website. It has a lot of real world stuff. And you can see up under here, under non-lethal, this is where they talk about the chemical weapons. And this website was closed. I do not know why. Um, they had a little pop-up note there that says that they're quitting. But um, this is also where I read about NMOD. And that's where I got um, that quote about the people lying under oath. And then you can also see two FOIAs right here, U.S. Air Force, U.S. Navy, using carbon black dust to modify the weather. Back to our story. So as you can see here, this is the Joint Non-Lethal Weapon Directorate's Chemical Weapons Program. These are the different locations around America where they do it, and they're still creating chemical weapons today. And here, pr protection of proliferation, high contaminant labs and other facilities in the U.S. Biodefense Program. There they are. And this is also from the Sunshine Project. God bless them. This as well as from there, Agent Green and the Drug War. So everybody's heard about Agent Orange. There were actually many different agents. They're called the Rainbow Agents. And these Rainbow Agents, um, this one in particular, this agent uh, threatens to legitimize agricultural biowarfare are environmentally unsafe and threaten wild plants and agriculture and fragile and biodiverse ecosystems. They endanger human health and, most importantly, the global ban on biological weapons. 
So um, the U.S. military is like, screw your um, ban. We're going to um, go and spray something called F. oxysporum, which you can see here, F. oxysporum infected cotton, uh, bean field, uh, watermelons, and uh, asters. Now they said that they were going to use this, and it's from um, Martin Gelsma, Gelsma's Chronology of Micro herbicide development against drug plants with special reference to the genus Fasurium and Pleospora. Now, basically, this Agent Green was supposed to kill, um, you know, uh, uh, what's the word? My goodness. It's supposed to kill the uh, poppy plants, all right? And also the marijuana plants. They were spraying it all over South America, Afghanistan, and this was supposed to just kill that, but unfortunately, it's made its way back to America. 89, 90, Texas USA farmers and ranchers report numerous outbreaks of illegal, of illness among pigs and horses, test fine, fumonescent concentrations in corn-based horse feed at 126 parts per million, Cameron County, Texas, rates of neural tube birth defects begin to rise. 2000 U.S. Um, Food and Drug Administration issues draft guidelines for maximum levels of fuminescent um, allowed in food. <laughs> uh, 2012, um, two, um, Representative John Micah brings up his desire to restart the fusinarium mica herbicide program in the U.S. Ho House hearing. America's heroin crisis, Colombian heroin, and how we can improve Plan Colombia. Plan Colombia. So, this is today the U.S. military spraying from planes of a, a fungus that destroys plants, also hurts people. And of course, back to the zinc, cadmium sulfide stuff there. And then we have microspheres for micro worlds. Uh, Harold Say pointed this one out to me. And uh, basically, they take um, radioactive material and they make these glass balls. And inside the glass balls, they can put all kinds of stuff, um, like drug delivery, <laughs> is what they say in their in their uh, thing. Let's see if we can bring that up real quick. It's really great. Um, Microspheres for micro worlds. The Savannah River National Lab has developed a novel class of materials for a variety of potentially new and exciting applications. Yeah. And then, uh, so these glass balls can be filled with, um, you know, of course, drugs, so they can put it in your body. But this is very interesting, what I, what I read in there. It says, what looks like a fertilized egg flowers, flows like water, is stuffed with catalysts and exotic nanostructures, and may have the potential for making current retail gasoline infrastructure compatible with hydrogen-based vehicles of the future, not to mention also contributing to arenas such as nuclear proliferation and global warming. So, they're talking about filling these uh, balls with sulfur. You should read about this stuff. In fact, the Savannah River Nuclear uh, National Lab is involved in more than half a dozen programs and collaborations with the PWHGMs in areas such as abatement of global warming effects. So, these nuclear glass balls can be filled with sun-reflecting sulfur and added to fuel tanks of jet airplanes. You cannot make this shit up. The combined effort is expected to lead to new capabilities and initiatives for educating and training the next generation of nuclear warfare for workforce in support of regional and national interests such as energy independence, nuclear medicine, nuclear deterrence, and safeguards and global warming. Yeah. So, um, and then this paper is from the Cybercast News Service. I don't know how to vet this thing. It's ChristianHeadlines.com, but this is this was said. These particles consist of a very fine and special form of glass, porous wall of glass microspheres, which is what we're talking about, um, would be able to absorb a certain amount of carbon dioxide and would reflect sunlight away from the Earth. The overall goal of this task is to understand and evaluate the implications of deploying porous glasses as an agent to reduce global warming. And it jives with what's being said right here on their own website. So um, that's some stuff, guys. That is some stuff. Delivery of chemicals with microcapsules, also using those calmatives and uh, you know weapons-grade chemical weapons 
inside of these glass balls. So this is stuff going on today. Nanotechnology paves way for new weapons. Regulating weaponized nanotechnology. How the International Criminal Court offers a way forward. But the U.S. military doesn't really give a damn about your laws. UAV constellations. This is from the Air Force 2025 series, and it's actually called Weather, Const Weather Control UAV Constellations. Provide precise control for aerosol dispersal. Allow control suspension of airborne particles, enabling weather control over localized area, providing pre precise control for electromagnetic magnetic, and other field generation. And that's, uh, you know, of course, putting a lot of aluminum powder in the sky can help you control your directed energy weapons. And uh, Alana Freeland has a great book on that. Um, Harb chemtrails and the full spectrum dominance of <laughs> of the world. So, guys, what I'm trying to show you here is yes, it's going on right now. Um, there's a lot of you know chemical weapons, uh, a lot of reasons that they're spraying the sky. However, how are we going to do anything about that? Because a, it's top secret. B, it's not national security. And C, they really don't give a damn about your opinion. So what I've been trying to do is, you know, focus on things that I can prove and do something about it in a court of law, like going to the EPA. So what you see is, A, sulfuric acid from aviation and ship tracks may be higher today than geoengineering SRM would require in 2020. So David Key said we're going to have to need this much sulfur to cool the planet. Guess what? There's that much sulfur already up there. Um, B, the U.S. Department of Homeland Security is already in the weather modification business. They had this thing called the Hurricane Weather Modification Workshop where, um, you know, all of these jerks got together and talked about what they would do. And let's be specific, limited scale field tests, salt seeding tests, carbon black aerosol, upper ocean cooling, ion generator seeding, and monolayer films, which is putting oil on the surface of the ocean to cool it off so or to keep it from... Uh, you know spreading in the sky so what happens is this guy doc, dr masha alamaro says collaborative research on hurricane modification by carbon black dispersion what is carbon black i talk about it on my chemtrail page right here you can see all about it before masha alamaro there was dr william gray who said steering hurricanes with carbon black dust weather modification by carbon dust absorption of solar energy and you can see it right there so that's carbon dust there's the masha alamaro and of course the military which is here U.S. military discusses future of weather warfare despite the NMOD ban because they really don't care about the law um, when it comes to modifying the weather and things like that. So you can see that um, in these slides, and I obtained this from, um, let's see if I got the link here. Yep, right there. So this came from uh, archive.org. It's dtc.army.mil slash tts slash 1997 slash proceeds slash a barns. And you can see the links there. This is where I got it from. So everybody knows at home I'm not making this shit up. Bam. All right. So let's go back. They First they show some of the stuff from Weather 2025, owning the weather. So it wasn't just a paper to all you debunker fools out there that don't know what the hell you're talking about. Um, this was put into action at this meeting. And uh, let's go down. Treaty issues. There's NMOD. You know, oh, we can get around that. Local non-permanent changes such as precipitation enhancement, hail suppression, fog, and cloud dispersal are permitted under the UN Treaty. derp a derp And then back to the what we can do with weather warfare. And, oh, there's HARP. You gotta love that. They call it a weapon system in here. Gotta love that. So then they say, um, you know, things we've done, previous weather modification by this lab, FIDO, which is a fog clearing, uh, clearing super cool fog, hole clearing with carbon black, hole clearing with silver iodide, hole clearing by helicopter, Ho Chi Minh Trail, muddying, that's the weather warfare, Operation Popeye, and contrail suppression. Interesting. So what we have here is weather modification using carbon black. And they say specifically that they would like to use carbon black dust to modify the weather. There's slide two. Increase cirrus cloud cover to deny visual satellite and high altitude reconnaissance. So create a blanket so that uh, spies can't see us from space or from high altitude planes. And decrease light level for nighttime operations. Yeah, so carbon black dust is the weapon of choice of the U.S. military today. As you see on the chemtrail page, we have two FOIAs that were obtained by the Sunshine Project that say the same thing. 
Title, Weather Modification Using Carbon Black, dated 1994. Phillips Laboratory, still at it. And here's their projected costs from 1995 to 2004. And then in the weather modification or the owning weather as a force multiplier owning the weather in 2025, they say right here 2005 carbon black dust. Bam. With a star, technologies to be developed by the DOD. There's those slides we just talked about. And the final slide current capabilities. This is 1997 now. Create, suppress, contrails, and cirrus. Right there. Create, suppress, cirrus, contrails. So they could make the chemical chemtrails that just like we're all seeing back in 1997 which coincidentally is the first time Kim Trails was ever used on the internet not a coincidence so you can see by this paper here that you know the military is back at it of course all of these articles are on climateviewer.com and uh, I put a copy of uh, the PDF version of it up on Scribd right here so you can go over and uh, download that and share it with your uh, favorite senator good stuff so what we know is the military's back at it, and they really don't give a damn about the law, and I've still got to be able to try to do something about this. So, for me, I calls it pollution. Because even if it is an intentional weather modification program from the government, which we all believe and evidence shows that it is, you still got to be able to do something about it. So, when the EPA said, um, you know, if you think that planes are endangering human health, come tell us. I went to a hearing. You can see it right there. Um, you know, I went to the, to the Washington, D.C. and chewed their ass out on C-SPAN, along with four of my friends. So the reason I call it um, pollution when I'm talking to them is because I can't prove that there's a government conspiracy or a government secret program or this the way you can prove it. Maybe is what I'm doing now. I want to do Freedom of Information Act request to China Lake in California, which is a U.S. Navy base, to the Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, um, because that's where the Air Force Research Lab is. And, uh, you know, I'm going to be cr creative with this. So what I think that is the only way to really get to the bottom of this, whether it's a government program or not, is really through the FOIA. And even then, I, according to the Sunshine Project website that I was linking to earlier, they have um, several FOIAs that just have not been answered. So, what do you do in that situation? Where you know it's a government program, you can't get an answer, and they just don't give a fuck. You still got to fight. So, that's why I do what I do. Um, but, unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to do it much longer. Well, I know that I probably will never stop doing this, but unfortunately, you know, I've got um, I got to get a job. So, I put my life on hold for three years to create all this material here. Um... And I love doing it. And I wish I could do it all day, every day, but unfortunately it doesn't pay the bills. So I got a baby on the way. My new baby's Emma. My old my old baby's six years old now, Caroline. And my wife has supported me all the way through this. But unfortunately, um, my new job's going to be like six days a week. And uh, that doesn't leave a whole lot of time for anything other than hugging my family. So I'm hoping that... Um, that I can find the energy to continue doing this because I really don't see anybody out there that says what I got to say or thinks like I got to think. And it really hurts my soul to think that um, that all this could go to shit if I stop doing it because nobody really gets it or wants to get it, it seems like. So guys, um, please review the information. I will keep the website up whether I continue or not. And... Um, Spread it around, get to know it, and um, you know, offer your suggestions. If you can come up with a better way to deal with this than I've already come up with, let me know. Um, you know, my phone number is at the bottom of the page, for crying out loud, <laughs> and my address. So, guys, I love you, mean it. I have put every bit of my heart and soul into this for the last five years. Um, last three, I you know quit my job to try to really hammer it home. Um, and it seems like the you know, New World Order just pushes along with their agenda. And you know, despite all my hard work, you know, geoengineering will be necessary to meet COP21 goals. Academics call for geoengineering in preparation of, in wake of Paris Agreement's deadly flaws. So I don't know that, um, 
I don't know that activism like it was in the 70s is alive today. I really haven't seen it. I've seen a lot of people talk in public places and very few of them with any solutions or plans. And, you know, what I thought would, you know, really change the world has turned out to be, you know, a lot of fighting, a lot of trolling, (laughs) a lot of people hurting my family. And um, I don't know how much longer I can take that. So, guys, I've practically run myself hoarse. This is a very long video. I hope that you guys will, you know, review the information and do something with it. Unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. Love you, mean it.